I've got my contact information uh, down there at the corner. If uh, you need to reach me, uh, email is always the uh, the best way to get a hold of me. I do have an office number as well. Um, the topic for tonight is our tree protection ordinance for the city of Knoxville. And uh, it does have a little bit of history. Um, it actually was put into place back in 1962. Uh, so we are looking at about 60 years old or moving towards 60 years old on our tree protection ordinance. It has been amended many of times, added, deleted, uh, many, many amendments over the years. Uh, the most, most uh, recent one was in 2014 where we did an overhaul on the entire uh, third article of trees on public property. And uh, as a side note, the tree board is currently looking at uh, the, the other aspects of the tree protection ordinance, uh, article two, as it pertains to development and trees on private property. So we will be looking at those in the coming months and looking at trying to address some of the issues and bring some of that up to, to, up to date as well. Um, as many of you may not know, uh, uh, the, one of the big things for us to be a Tree City USA is that we actually have to have a tree protection ordinance in place. It's one of the four requirements um, that, that is required as far as our community. Um, and our tree protection ordinance for the city of Knoxville is actually broken into two different articles. Article two, trees on private property, and Article 3, Trees on Public Property. And essentially, um, I, know I, can, I know everybody always asks me, well, what happened to Article 1? Well, that's left reserved in case we need to add anything down the road. But that's essentially what the two different articles are. And we will break those up into two different pieces as I go through this presentation tonight. So, as it's written, um, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say our, our specifically our ordinance, but uh, ordinances in general, the purposes of tree protection ordinance oftentimes are grouped into a lot of different benefits that are associated with trees. Uh, for this particular uh, discussion, um, we're gonna be talking about heating and cooling costs, the aesthetics, the stormwater value of trees, pollution control, recreational wildlife, and what's, often uh, the up and coming benefits of trees, the social, economic, and the very vast array of environmental benefits as well. Um, you'll see that tree protection ordinances, anytime they talk about the purpose and the intent of the ordinance will oftentimes bring many of these different items uh, into play. So some of them may be specifically written for stormwater purposes. Others may be specifically written for, you know, the protection uh, of, of wildlife. Um, our ordinance, as you will see in the coming slides, has a couple of different purposes involved in it and then the reasons why it was written. And it's very important because ultimately everything else, all the, all the other codes that follow on past the, the intent have to be written in a way to meet the intent and what the ordinance was written for. So, so these are going to be the items that are written as far as the intent as it's currently written in our uh, tree protection ordinance for the purpose of controlling solar heat, air pollution, and noise. Uh, flood control and soil conservation, as we know that uh, trees play an important role in that. As you can see on my slide to the, uh, the, the right, you can actually see where a riparian area has actually been uh, impacted by the removal of several trees, um, which in, in many instances would be a violation of the tree protection ordinance. One of the things that's written into our tree protection ordinance, um, which is kind of interesting, is the fact that they do mention the psychological relief from increasing complexities of man-made urban environments. And I bring this up because a lot of our new studies in urban forestry are really gearing towards for this particular thing right here. The fact that this was written into our, our ordinance almost 60 years ago, and we are just now here in 2020 are starting to study these impacts is quite astonishing. Um, so what we do know is that with our, 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 our 
urban environment comes a lot of stress, not only stress on trees, but stress on people. And what that big thing that people really are starting to gear and, and look at these days are how does green space trees and the softening of, of uh, plants help minimize that psychological uh, uh, pressure that we have as humans um, from the complexities of our urban environment. And so I always tell people, if you were to look at the two different slides, and neither of these two slides are here in Knoxville, Tennessee, but if you were to look at the, uh, the, the uh, neighborhood on the left, you could see a newer subdivision, um, does have green space, a lot of yards, um, but does not necessarily have trees. And if you will look to the one on the right where you see a, a house uh, that's completely covered by trees, um, a lot of these new studies right now are looking at what, what is it that may be different for folks living in these two different types of communities? How, how could it be more, how, how are their, their ways of dealing with this, this complexity different? And so I don't have the answer for that, but I can tell you that uh, right now there is a lot of um, uh, interest in trying to figure out this and look at how green space really does impact our, our well-being as humans. Really what it comes down to, and, and this is a picture of me in front of the uh, largest sassafras tree in uh, the United States. Well, actually for that matter, it would be the world. But uh, what we really look at as far as tree protection ordinances is really looking at trees as infrastructure. Um, I think oftentimes the, the complexity of tree protection ordinances, is the fact that people see trees also in sometimes emotional ways, uh, but really what it comes down to is they really do service us and our communities and we have to look at them just as we would streets, lights, storm drains, uh, everything else that's involved with the different infrastructure that makes our city what it is and trees have a part in that and that's what what the purpose intent of tree protection ordinances is, is to uh, designate what those uh, or how those different types of infrastructures are going to be um, incorporated into the city and how they're going to be protected. So we're gonna start off article two, tree protection ordinance. Again, this is really pertains to development and trees on private property. Not so much about the trees that are in our parks or along our streets. Most mostly have to do with development. So just make sure everyone's on the same page on this. So the definition of a tree is different in both articles. So in article one, the definition of a tree is any woody plant with a trunk with is six inches in diameter at one foot above ground. Or is a tree of a horticulture variety that is three inches in diameter at one foot above ground. So the question that often comes up here is what if I have a oak tree that is five inches in diameter? That oak tree for purposes and intents of article two would not be considered a tree. Even though we all know that an oak tree is a tree. At this point in time, it's not gonna fall under the regulations of this ordinance because it is not six inches in diameter. Very similarly, if we start talking about horticultural varieties such as a dogwood, a redbud, a hawthorn, those would only have to be three inches in diameter to be uh, held in regulation of the tree protection ordinance under Article 2. The applicability of, of Article 2, um, this pertains to uh, well, really what it comes down to is how the land is used and not the how the land is zoned. So uh, that's very important to understand that. So you could have a residential property that may be a vacant lot, and we'll, I'll show you some examples later down the road. Um, that vacant lot as it stands right now is, is not being used as a residential house. It may be zoned as residential, but it's not being used as residential because there's no house on that particular lot at this particular time. Um, it applies to all real property within the city of Knoxville, except for it has a few exceptions. Any single family dwelling or duplex. So any residential property 
that is single family or duplex do not apply to Article 2. And it also does not apply to airports, utility right of ways, any state, federal, or lo uh, local government, or any parcels of land that fall under any of those jurisdictions as well. So uh, really what it comes down to is really what you're looking at are large residential properties, such as apartment complexes, um, commercial properties, and industrial properties, and vacant lots is really where most of this applies to. pop this up um, so for residential properties one of the questions that often comes up is okay can my next door neighbor do whatever they want on their property well the example of these two uh, pictures right here so this would be a single family residential home and if that tree or if that particular parcel of land wanted to do whatever it is what they wanted to do on their property they have the right to the tree protection ordinance does not apply Article two of the tree protection ordinance does not apply to that particular property. Now you see a multi-residential, such as an apartment complex here. Uh, these particular trees that fall on this property would, uh, would apply to the article two of the tree protection ordinance. Uh, the only exception for these are any trees under six inches in diameter. So that's where the, uh, the complexity of this ordinance as it stands falls as of today. Now we're going to take this a step farther. Hopefully you're all still with me as of right now. And I can promise you the, uh, the trees on public property, it's going to be a lot more clear because that's the most updated version of the tree protection ordinance. So let's we'll just get through this first uh, article together and we'll, we'll get there. Uh, building permit uh, is a huge part of this, of the tree protection ordinance. And really it's going to be which way you go as far as how the tree protection ordinance is going to be administered. So if you are not applying for a building permit, um, you only have to submit a plan showing the groups of trees and the species of trees in those particular areas. If you're applying for a building permit, you have to submit a plan that shows all the individual trees, species, and those that you are you are per, uh, set to preserve on that particular property. Now, what I can tell you on this particular uh, code is that the um, uh, the 2019 zoning code, and there are some landscaping requirements on that, actually does require more as far as what is put into play on the building permit side, and so. As of it stands, as it stands right now, the the tree protection ordinance, when it comes to those parcels of land that are applying for a building permit, actually have more regulations on the zoning code than they would for the tree protection code as it, or tree protection ordinance as of right now. So, hopefully, everyone's still with me. So, if you're if you don't have a building permit, and you just, let's say you're a, a McDonald's or a, a Burger King or a, a, a residential uh, apartment complex. Um, the rule as it stands is that no more than 25% of trees on any one parcel of land can be removed in a five year period. The question that often comes up at this point in time is, well, what happens after five years? Can they remove another 25%? And the answer to that would be yes, which often gets very difficult to try and regulate that in the fact that you would have to use aerial photography and data from, from past uh, photos and things like that to, to help administer that to see if, if, if a particular parcel of land is in violation of the tree protection ordinance. People oftentimes ask me, well, who's, who's in charge of seeing these things and looking for these things? Well, Essentially, I'm a one-man army that oversees the tree protection ordinance. Uh, we do have some assistance from time to time with our, our folks in our, 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 our codes enforcement, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's usually on a complaint-driven basis of when these things start to come to my attention. So, again, no more than 25% of the trees, those are trees that are six inches and over, so don't forget about that on any one parcel of land shall be removed in a five year period. 
the building permit, if you are applying for a building permit, the thing that triggers this is a minimum of six trees per acre shall be retained on the site unless the fill work does not allow the trees to be preserved. The fill or the cut work does not allow the trees to be preserved. So for instances on this, if, if a, uh, somebody's gonna go build a, um, a new commercial property on a vacant lot and they have the entire, the entire parcel is full of trees, they are able to go ahead and uh, remove all the trees. Let's say the, the, uh, the, the, the parcel was one acre. They're able to remove all the trees except for six of those trees, six inches in diameter, uh, in order to meet the requirements of the tree protection ordinance. I will also say that the 2019 zoning code, as it stands right now, um, actually puts more incentives on preservation and they try and incentivize and synthesize the uh those who are doing developments to try and retain mature trees on the property so what happens if you can't uh, retain six trees per, on the property as it says here you're allowed to remove them if if the fill work does not allow you to uh, preserve them and as many of us know Anytime you start building a building or development, there's going to be a lot of cut and a lot of fill material. So very, if it's an optional uh, regulation, oftentimes those trees are going to be removed. Oh. I'm going to jump back. I'll get that. I'll get there in just a minute. Uh, I'm going to talk about this particular uh, parcel or this particular so slide right here. Um, I wanted to point out uh, this particular parcel right here. Uh, this is actually uh, in Knoxville. This is actually the Coles out in the uh, the north uh, east side of town. By east, this is East Town Mall or the old East Town Mall right here. So when this was being developed, essentially, you can see all these other trees on the parcel right here. Essentially, all they have to do. Let's say this is a ten acre lot and they have to retain six trees per acre on this particular lot. All they have to do is show that in this area right here that they have 60 trees still standing in this particular area, and they can go ahead and develop this area and they'd still be in compliance with the tree protection ordinance. Um, I will state that the uh, tree protection ordinance does not deal with uh, trees on parking lots or for screening purposes. Those are all taken care of in the zoning code. Now, if we look over at another parcel of land down here, you can see a couple different parcels. There's about four or five of these vacant lot parcels over here on Ernstein, uh, Ernstein Drive. These are probably zoned uh, residential property, if these particular trees were, let's say the property owners just wanted to remove them on their own, even though they're residential property, we would have to make sure that no more than 25% of these trees were being removed at a given time, up until the point where they applied for a building permit, in which point they only have to preserve six trees per acre. All right. Jumping through now, if you can't preserve trees on the par property as it stands um, and, and, and with your building permit, within a 12 month period, you must provide trees and you must provide them at a rate of eight trees per acre. Of those eight trees, 50% of them must be large growing trees. So again, make sure I, everyone's with me on this, if you can't, preserve trees on the property and you're applying for a building permit, you're able to remove all the trees and replant those trees within a 12 month period uh, once the project's completed and you must plant eight trees per acre and only 50% of those have to be large growing trees. So essentially you could have four red buds and four oak trees. Um, I, again, there are, I often get questions about diversity, can you plant all one the same species or anything like that. Uh, 12 months ago you could, now you can't because of the zoning code does require, have some requirements as far as uh, 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 diversification is concerned. 
So this is what often people always, Paul's and I, they, they ask me, you know, is six trees per acre to preserve and eight trees per acre enough? Is that what we want? And what I always tell people is all types of tree protection ordinance have all types of different mechanisms. You have to go back to the intent of what that tree protection ordinance is set up for. And ultimately, what we're trying to do with our tree protection ordinance are all those different things that I mentioned before, you know, uh, improving air quality, um, uh, making sure that water quality is considered, uh, trying to lessen the blow and improve aesthetics, things like that, lessen the blow of the harsh urban environment, things like that. So I don't have an, uh, an answer for that. Um, although I can say that there are many times a lot of, of different items that are at play when it comes to tree protection ordinance. The mechanism for us is that we look at individual tree count as, as what is going to drive our tree protection ordinance. Some communities may look at the overall tree canopy of a parcel of land or a property. Uh, others may only look at historical trees. Are, are trees of a certain size? Are they 20 inches or diameter? Other than that, we don't really care about the other trees. Um, some will be looking at not looking at trees as a quantity at all, only looking at how trees are maintained and the quality of tree care that trees get. Um, everybody still with me? I'm getting some feedback. We are. Um, if participants could please check to make sure their microphones are off. Thank you. All right, can we, are we good now? Thumbs up, Tracy. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so, so the mechanism needs to meet the purpose of the tree protection ordinance. And I, I, my analogy I always tell people on this is, let's say the intent is to build the fastest car in the world. Um, you, you may look at it and say, okay, let's focus in on the tires. Let's focus in on the engine. Let's focus in on the uh, aerodynamics of the car whatever it may be. There's a lot of different ways that you can focus in on it. It's usually not just one thing. Um, what, I, what I tend to tell people is that merely looking at just the number of trees is not always going to meet all of the goals and objectives uh, of your tree protection ordinance unless your, your objective is just to preserve whatever that quantity is. It gets very difficult when you start talking about water quality and you start talking about um, uh, air quality and things like that and starting to relate that just to a tree count and not the overall picture of trees. So uh, that's my analogy. Um, hopefully that makes sense. And uh, uh, the importance of making sure that those mechanisms, again, going back to this particular slide, we use a tree count for that mechanism to meet the goals of our tree protection ordinance. Oftentimes there's many other mechanisms that are in play. So the maintenance and replacement of trees. So trees retained or planted must be properly maintained to ensure the survival for 18 months after that property has been uh, accepted. Essentially, after the development has gone through, been built, those trees must survive for 18 months. Um, that is what is written in the tree protection ordinance. And if they don't survive, they must be replaced in a 12 month period. What I can tell you is that all of these uh, requirements, uh, or excuse me, all of these trees that fall under the building permit do fall under our, our zoning code. And what has new in the new 2019 zoning code is that the uh, landscaping must be preserved in perpetuity. So essentially, these two clauses of the tree protection ordinance don't even apply anymore, except for in those rare, very rare instances where you'll have a property that is not um, uh, that does not have a uh, building permit and. Uh, maybe removing trees on a particular property. Uh, 
can't tell you that that happens often. It does happen, believe it or not. Um, you may have a vacant lot where somebody just wants to remove trees for whatever reason. Um, and, and it does trigger the tree protection ordinance. And uh, oftentimes uh, we tell them that you either have to get a building permit or you have to plant the trees back. Um, and uh, in, in those particular cases, those trees would have to, to survive for that eight month, 18 month period because those particular properties are not falling under the zoning code because they have not applied for a building permit as of uh, as of that date so all right moving forward the penalty <clears throat> the one that everyone always uh looks forward to uh the punished uh pun uh, the people who are in violation of this are punished as provided in section 1-9 of the Knoxville code. Uh, that is $50 a day, not to exceed $500 and or 30 days in jail for each occurrence. And there is a separate violation for each day. What oftentimes is very difficult when you start talking about trees and this particular code, which is, uh, from my understanding, is what the state statute allows um, it gets very difficult because you start talking about what if we, you know, a, a 20 year old tree was removed. Is it every day until the new tree is 20 years old? Uh, is it every day until the tree gets planted? Um, you know, it, it gets very sticky at times trying to administer a living thing that takes many years to grow on a code that, that is very finite in its, in its direction as far as, you know, the, the dollar amount and, and, and the, uh, the, the, the fines. So I keep wanting to ask if there are any questions, uh, cause this is a very lengthy presentation or very uh, detailed. And unfortunately, hopefully you guys are answering or asking questions on the dialogue box. So moving on, <clears throat> we are going to get to the, um, uh, trees on public property. We are sitting at uh, 30 past the hour, so we are exactly halfway through the presentation and moving forward in the right direction. Uh, trees on public property. This is the one, again, this was uh, uh, updated in 2014. I think it's going to make a little bit more sense. Uh, it's going to probably uh, come together a little bit more. Um, and this was one of those housekeeping things that we wanted to make sure that we took care of early on uh, when we started our urban forestry program. Uh, there was a lot of changes. I think oftentimes we wanted to look at the, uh, the tree protection ordinance as it pertains to article two, um, but we had the new zoning code came out. We didn't know how that was going to be administered. And we had a lot of other things that were coming through the pipeline and we just have not had an opportunity to bring that one up to speed as of, uh, as of 2020. So trees on public property, the definitions, again, the definition of the tree in itself is going to be different, but in a whole, this article actually has 25 to 30 different definitions that define all types of different things. Uh, I put four of these things up on the slide here because those are, those tend to be the, uh, the items that are oftentimes confused and um, uh, that the definitions have to go, we have to always go back and look at these definitions. So the first thing is what is a tree? Uh, so you'll see right off the bat, a tree in article three is any woody plant that gets 15 feet tall. It doesn't have the diameter classification on this. It's any tree, so I could plant a seedling on public property and that very next day, that tree is going to be uh, uh, under the jurisdiction of the article three of the tree protection ordinance. Tracy could plant a tree on city park. Um, we may not know about it, but if she did, uh, that tree would be protected under the city tree protection ordinance. So, so a public tree, trees planted or maintained by the city. Uh, that is the definition of a public tree. And this is where oftentimes people get confused on the difference between right of way and city property because right of way is often construed as city property and it's not. Uh, the right of way is any area within an easement that city has a right to use or improve. So a right of way does not equate to city property. And as the picture down here on the left, 
as you can see, and many of you have, I'm sure, have driven down the streets of Knoxville, uh, I've noticed that there are millions upon millions of trees within that right of way uh, within the city of Knoxville. Um, oftentimes, trees that uh, we don't, uh, we have not looked at, we have not inspected. Um, if they've come to our attention, again, uh, we have the right to use or improve that right of way. So we do have the right to amend those uh, issues in the right of way, but it's not ownership. We do not own those particular trees unless we planted them. So the hey, other thing that comes into place, I'm sorry, Tracy, what were you saying? I was just going to say before you get too far, there's a question in the box yes. from Lee. Um, I think that refers to if a person plants a tree in a park, it's protected and it says even if it were an invasive, Sure, it would be protected under the tree protection ordinance and we could administer that tree what's best suited for the uh, residents of the city of Knoxville. So yes, even if that, if that somebody wanted to plant a mimosa uh, in a city park, uh, and they did, uh, it would be, it would fall under this jurisdiction. Now, we will get to that in a minute. They're not allowed to plant the tree without approval from the city. So they would be in violation before that tree even got there. But let's say that mimosa just popped up on city property. Yes, it would fall. It, it, is, uh, it is protected under the tree protection ordinance. Good question, Lee. Um, so city property, again, is property owned or leased by the city or any part of an improved right-of-way. As far as the city's concerned, what a, an improved right-of-way is, is anywhere that, up to the point where we have made improvements within the right-of-way. So oftentimes that would be a sidewalk, a street, light, um, um, things like that that we have made improvements within that right of way. So as you can see here on this street here in Knoxville, uh, there's not improvements past the curb. So all of those trees would be considered private trees at that particular area. Um, everyone's probably wondering why all our members of the tree board have came up. The uh, Article 3 of the Tree Protection Ordinance actually establishes the creation of the tree board and establishes the, uh, uh, the urban forester for the city of Knoxville as well. It's actually written in there that the city will have a urban forester. Um, it does not have to be Casey Krause. It could be anybody um, that meets certain requirements within the ordinance. It, I believe it has something to have to have a four-year degree and, and has to uh, meet certain requirements um, and then it also sets aside the tree board and what those duties of the tree board are um, as far as looking at uh, the trees across the city of Knoxville they're required to help advise um, city council and the mayor and help direct the city as far as tree related concerns go and uh, there's actually about two pages of written both these establishments of the urban forestry and the tree board. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into all those requirements, but that is written into the uh, tree protection ordinance, the creation of the tree board and of the urban forester. Within the uh, tree protection ordinance, there is a requirement for an appropriate species list that can be used uh, for trees being planted on city property. Uh, so going back to Lee's question, can somebody plant an invasive species? Uh, there are not invasive species as we know it right now on the, uh, the uh, tree list. And I, I will share a slide here in just a minute to kind of show you some, an example of one of those lists. Um, in the code, or in the, uh, in the code, it does mention that the list must contain, be broken into three parts. It must have small trees, medium-sized trees, and large trees, and you can see those uh, different measurements there. So small being 15 to 30 feet, medium being 30 to 50 feet, and large being those trees that can reach 50 feet and over. And uh, the list, uh, it does not state that the list must be put together by the City of Knoxville Tree Board, but I will state that that was a public process uh, where the tree board uh, put together the list, looked at the list, approved the list, and we put that list together and it's now being administered on our City of Knoxville Urban Forestry website. Uh, also we'll note that the zoning code of 2019 also mentions the tree list and that any trees being planted on 
uh, as far as requirements of the zoning code for landscaping purposes must be uh, within that tree uh, tree list as well. So there's the uh, the the link. Um, but also here's an example of that tree list. So these are the medium sized trees and you can look at that. You, I'm sure not all of you can read that, uh, but you can see there's about 25 to 30 different medium sized trees. Um, we also broke it into you know, the different uh, uh, aspects of the tree. So you'll look at the tree form, uh, the growth rate of the trees, the aesthetics of the tree, the fall color. So folks can use this at home as well. So it's also a resource as, as far as also a part of regulation, so. So the jurisdiction, oftentimes people ask about, okay, who has the right to do work on, on, uh, on public trees? The city has the right to plant, care for, maintain, remove, replace public trees, shrubs, and other plantings as may be necessary to ensure safety and enhance beauty within the public uh, property or the right-of-way so essentially this sets aside our, our ability to plant trees in the right-of-way uh, plant trees in our parks if a tree becomes unsafe or, or or has an issue associated with it as far as the public may be concerned the city has a right to maintain those trees on public property as well Obstruction and location of trees. This is probably where I tell people about 75% of our resources as far as our maintenance goes really pertains to this particular slide right here. Uh, most of our, our maintenance goes towards all of those other trees, private trees, as they relate to all the other public infrastructure across the city of Knoxville. And what I'm referring to those are are trees and landscaping that obstruct street lights, sidewalks, streets, or utilities, um, vegetation and trees and veg uh, uh, other landscaping that obstruct uh, traffic signs, sidewalks, uh, intersections. So if you pull out onto an intersection, you, you're trying to see and, and trees from private property are obstructing uh, uh, your ability to pull out onto that intersection safely. Um, I will note on this point, if you do have questions or concerns, people always ask, please call 311. That's where these work orders are put together. And, and really, uh, and I, I kid you not, that most of our resources, as far as our urban forestry division goes, goes with dealing with trees, um, private trees, as they relate to um, uh, issues on, on public streets and, and, and right of way. So, um, and also on that, uh, the removal, of any tree or tree part that could impact the public as well. That's also what's mentioned in that. And I will show you from our next slide why that is important because um, uh, trees from private property can be very impactful to uh, uh, the right of way and the use of, I should say, the improved right of way and how people utilize that right of way. Uh, so here we have a, a public street. Um, where a tree from private property has fallen over and, and actually hit a car. Uh, this did happen in Knoxville. Um, believe it or not, the individual who was in this car actually walked right out after that tree landed on the car um, without a scratch on them. Uh, it was their lucky day. But uh, again, why do we regulate certain aspects of private property. And this is why I always tell people because we need to make sure that these sorts of situations don't occur. Um, this actually happened uh, back in 2019, the spring of 2019. Um, it, I got the call from our maintenance folks, uh, or the, I shouldn't say our maintenance folks, the, uh, the crews that had arrived on the, uh, the scene there. And uh, they, they, they sent me these pictures and, and, uh, I couldn't believe that anybody walked out of this car, uh, let alone without a scratch on them. So uh, it was it was an interesting uh, uh, interesting day to say the least. Uh, topping and removal of trees. Um, again, the, the we were, were talking about trees on public property or those within an improved right of way that the city or trees that the city have planted. Um, it's, it's, it's any removal 
a public tree is prohibited and the topping of any public tree or any tree within the right of way is prohibited. So any private tree within the uh, right of way within the city of Knoxville, it is prohibited to top a tree. And that goes back, we put that into play to uh, one, uh, we, we were looking at possibly prohibiting topping in all public property uh, it is prohibited on any of those uh, trees that were planted as far as the uh, the building permit is required. You can't go in and top trees. Um, but the the one thing we were looking at was uh, how do we enforce it and are we able to enforce it? And, and we at the point in time thought that let's try and go about trying to educate folks about the importance of not topping trees. And uh, although this is still readily done in Knoxville, I, I do think we have seen uh, great improvements across the city of Knoxville as well. So um, the reason it is in play on the city right of way is that top trees, they tend to drop branches as they mature. And so what we didn't want is people able to drop, uh, excuse me, uh, top trees close to the streets to where they could become a public safety issue down the road. And so that one was worked out to, to prohibit topping uh, within the, the right of way um, across the city of Knoxville. A municipal tree care. Um, again, the urban forester must authorize the removal, treatment, pruning, spraying of any public tree. So going back to the question that was asked, can somebody plant a tree? Well, if they do plant it, as of that day, it is uh, protected under the tree protection ordinance. Um, but that individual by planting that tree is in violation unless they applied for a permit. So um, maintenance must conform to the American National Standards Institute, the ANSI 300s and the ANSI Z1333. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the American National Standards Institute, these are uh, the the uh, ANSI 300 is essentially the the standards in which. Um, uh, Aboriculture practices are administered. Um, it's a standards that have been put together by our industry and the tree industry um, to meet certain requirements um, and help hold certain uh, entities to professionalism. And so this was a big part getting this in there because as many of you who have been in Knoxville for more than uh, seven to eight years know, uh, we had, for example, a huge problem with tree mulching. So as you can see right here, is what we call the uh, the dreaded volcano mulch. And uh, we actually prohibited that. And it actually was a huge part in my ability to move maintenance along the right way. Um, we, we for years had to in institutionalize that mulching trees this way was the right way and it wasn't the right way. And it caused a lot of damage to trees. And so by putting it in the ordinance, uh, putting a little teeth behind it, uh, we were able to combat this. Um, we still have to deal with this every once in a while, but it's not from really uh, 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 city staff or city workers. It's mainly to do with uh, uh, those properties that are abutting or that, that abut to prop public trees um, that want to go out there and, and, and make their trees look pretty or want them to look a certain way. And, we have had to deal with apartment complexes that have mulched public trees this way, and we've had to deal with homeowners who have mulched trees this way. And usually a, a little bit of education goes a long way. Uh, I don't just instantly write them a $50 ticket. I try and educate them because it's a good opportunity for me to educate them because they can then take that practice back to their own property as well. Um, the, the big issue, as many of us know, is that oftentimes stem decay and girdling roots can occur uh, when you have mulch piled up along the trunk of the tree. Uh, this was something that came very evident uh, when we did our uh, um, ordinance back, or excuse me, our, our inventory back in 2011. We noticed that many uh, uh, dogwood trees and maple trees were dying at a very high rate. And really what it came back to was the improper mulching um, of trees and you can see that stem decay that occurs when that moisture sits up there and builds around the trunk of that tree. <clears throat> we also define the critical root zone of a tree um, and for this particular ordinance what it is defined as a critical root zone is that uh, for every inch in diameter 
you go one foot in uh, um, radius out from that trunk and that is going to be your critical root zone of a public tree. And again, uh, any disturbance to that critical root zone, you must get a permit from the city of Knoxville before you disturb anything within that critical root zone to make sure that you're doing it by best management practices. So I'm going to share with you, um, we're going to kind of, the last couple of slides here are going to be a lot of slides of some okay. issues with, uh, yes, Greg? There's a question in the chat from Elizabeth Martinez that says, uh, I see tree mulching volcanoes on commercial property and parking lots all the time, for example, Target. Are there any education efforts for these properties? Um, well, two things on that. Uh, I know that's one thing that the tree board has been uh, very adamant about in trying to combat the years that I've been here and trying to educate folks as well. Uh, the new thing as well is that with the new zoning code, uh, the 2019 zoning code is that, uh, again, they have to be uh, maintained in, in perpetuity. So forever, uh, those trees have to be maintained and they have to be maintained the right way. So that would be a restriction for any new commercial property that comes online to uh, pre prevent them from being able to mulch their trees in that direction. So there's a little bit of teeth. Uh, it's the enforcement that's that's the difficulty because um, again, just as with public trees, it was so difficult. I couldn't even get a hand on my own trees. It's very difficult trying to get a hand on everyone else's trees. But again, a lot of that is complaint driven. So if there are issues that can be uh, uh, brought up, and uh, there are a little bit more teeth in preventing those commercial properties from mulching their trees that way, and hopefully through time as we start to uh, uh, because it's not it's not like the, the 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 employees of Target are coming out there and mulching those trees wrong. It's it's the landscape companies that they're hiring, or those commercial properties are hiring. And so hopefully, through time, with a little bit of teeth and with the new zoning code, we start to see improvements on that. So here are some examples of some uh, uh, violations of the uh, critical root zone. You can see a. Uh, a sidewalk that got in here and got into all the, the roots on that particular tree and cut off all the roots. Um, and then you also can see heavy machinery uh, being parked in and around the root zone of, of public trees on the slide on the right. Uh, you also have got compaction issues as well. So disturbance to the critical root zone. Um, it includes compaction, it could cuts, fill, disruption, grubbing of soil and or trenching. Uh, here, on the picture on the right, you can see a nice set of tree protection ordinance or, or a, a BMP, our best management practice that are being put in play. You have there our, our fence that has been put up. Um, and then you see the silt fence going right through the middle of that tree protection fence. Well, in order to install that silt fence, you have to trench right through there. So um, that was, a, again, a, that would be a violation of the tree protection ordinance for that particular uh, project right there. Uh, getting a little bit more aggressive, uh, you can see uh, the soil and fill material from a, a utility project that was piled up in and around a tree. And you can also look at the machinery getting about as close as possible uh, without touching the trunk of the tree. And again, uh, these are violations of the tree protection ordinance as they stand. Um, oftentimes education goes a long way and we'll talk about what, what happens when these instances hap happen to public trees and how we recuperate any damages here in just a little bit. Uh, root pruning is a, a, a tactic that we have been employing quite often here at the city of Knoxville. People are looking at this like what what is going on here? You can actually see uh, this particular tree here, you can see the white marks. That was actually my paint to show where the critical root zone of this particular tree is. The reason I bring this picture up, we actually transplanted this tree at one of our parks. A parking lot was going in here. And so I set up the critical root zone of this particular tree. But I like this picture because it shows you um, a great example of what that critical root zone looks like. So you have about a six inch diameter tree and you come six feet out in radius and that's your critical root zone. And they're actually digging out in and around that area. And later on, we would come in here, lift up the rest of that, that root system from underneath, and we actually transplanted this tree to another location. 
um, in the park and actually still still surviving, believe it or not. So it was successful. We, it was a trial and error project and we it actually worked itself out. If you're wondering what all this is right here, that's not spill material that we piled there. That's actually the old uh, mulch pile that we broke apart from the uh, the uh, urban tree. And uh, that's the, uh, the fibrous roots and the mulch and all the other soil that was in that mulch pile up and around the base of the tree. So um, <clears throat> here's another root pruning project as well. Uh, this is actually at Market Square. This is where I, why, uh, right before we built the path, um, there was a lot of concerns about how that path would be built between all of the six oak trees. And we actually went in there and we root pruned down to the depth of where the trees were going to be excavated. And you can see uh, after the fact that the, uh, the bobcat here comes in and starts digging up the soil. Uh, believe it or not, uh, years and years of putting sod up and around the base of these trees, um, these are sawtooth oaks, uh, I only found two roots that were over one inches in diameter when I root pruned that entire area there. So. Uh, we didn't really impact a lot of roots uh, whatsoever when we actually built that 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 sidewalk. Um, the biggest issue we had was trying to avoid compaction on the rest of the root, tree roots. And if you go out there right now, it's not. Even, I don't think there's any sod there. It's all been landscaped now, and there's a walking path through there. So we, through time, we've actually reprogrammed that area to help uh, preserve those trees for the future. So impact to the critical root zone and protection, again, uh, any planting or any disturbance to the root system or any pruning of a tree or if any removal of a public tree would require a permit. There is a permit on file. Uh, you can find it at our urban forestry website. Um, but this is an example of what that permit looks like. Uh, we get about uh, two dozen of these a year, folks that want to do whatever it may be. Usually it has to do with um, development projects and uh, wanting to either remove a tree or prune a tree because they want to get a crane in there or they want to get some piece of machinery in there and they have to apply for a public tree permit. We also get a couple of neighborhoods as well that want to do um, planting within their neighborhood and we ask that they also uh, put together a, a permit. and. So, very quick turnaround, uh, usually about two to three days, and uh, uh, we get it back to them with approval. Uh, very rarely do we ever deny a permit, um, with the, but there is an opportunity for us to set up the actual um, requirements or the, uh, the mitigation that might occur if, if somebody were to uh, remove a tree or ask to remove a tree. Um, tree protection measures, again, that's that's an importance of the permit process. So we can actually, if through that process, we can actually put together what uh, BMPs or best management practices are going to need. Oftentimes it's put tree protection fencing up, don't move it for the duration of the project. Um, and we, we, through that permit process, can open that dialogue to where we can work together on a project where everybody's on the same page. Uh, tree mitigation, so uh, if 25% of the critical root zone of a tree canopy or uh, the root of that uh, uh, tree is disrupted, um, the person or firm who is responsible for the damage is required to mitigate inch for inch replacement using two inch caliper trees. So essentially what that means is for this particular tree here, um, this was actually, uh, again, a photo from 2010, I think it was, when the, uh, the inventory was taken. But you can see this was a new sidewalk project. But this day and age, uh, what we would actually require is that the sidewalk actually ramp over the root system and not through the root system. Um, and or look at possibly removing the tree before it actually happens. So if a contractor failed to look at what those requirements were, um, for this particular project um, and, and then failed to ramp over the root system and went right through them. And let's say that was a 20 inch diameter tree. Uh, we would actually require them to mitigate for that damage on a inch for inch basis where they would have to replace 10 two inch caliper trees in another location or a similar location. Um, oftentimes, you know, for that particular tree, there's, there's no going back. Um, 
if the damage is warranted and the tree needs to be removed, that's when the mitigation would kick in. <clears throat> so again, it's inch for inch. So 20 inches in diameter tree, 10 two inch caliper trees as far as the mitigation is required. So I always like, I like this picture because you kind of get an idea what 10 two inch caliper trees look like. Those, so we lose this, but all the, we gain all these. And the idea is through time, all of these trees can become 20 inch diameter trees and we actually get a, a net increase in, in what was lost. A penalty, that's same as Article 2, you've got the $50 a day, the $500 maximum, the 30 days in jail. Um, haven't yet thrown anybody in jail yet. Um, each day is a new occurrence, just as in Article uh, 2. Um, but in addition, what we added on this was uh, any person found to be in violation of this article shall be responsible for the reimbursement to the city for the value of trees described in the latest edition of the, the guide for plant appraisal. So we can actually do a, a plant appraisal on damage. Um, and the reason that is, is not all trees need to be removed. Sometimes it may just be damage to a tree um, and we have to fix that damage. Um, and we can actually appraise the cost to cure that particular tree and, and assess that damage to the individual. So an example, um, we have actually put into our lawn mo or mowing contracts is, is this exact thing right here is that we, right off the bat, if there's any weed eater damage, we have looked at the overall costs for us to try and fix that tree. Additional watering, um, any sort of mulching that we may do, anything, any, any, any extra work that like a weed eater may have done for us to try and make that tree healthy again. Uh, the additional waterings as well that we need to do because that, that tree is going to be stressed out. We have actually put just a fixed cost into our uh, mowing contracts. And so if a mowing contractor dings a particular tree with their weed eater, uh, it's right off the bat, I believe it's $170 uh, that is deducted from their pay for that, that mowing cycle. Um, they do two trees, you've got $240. So or excuse me, three hundred and forty dollars. So uh, you can see where uh, you can see where it goes. It adds up very quickly, especially if they're only going to get paid, you know, twelve hundred dollars. You're not going to want to damage too many trees. Uh, we have enforced this with two different contractors, um, and we have seen great improvements as well as far as contractors being more conscious around the trees with lawn mowers and weed eaters and things like that. So, um, so here's an example of a tree uh, that uh, of a car that has hit a tree on Middlebrook Pike. Uh, you can see down here um, the damage to the bottom of the tree. Uh, this was a hit and run. Uh, fortunately, we were able to still uh, figure out the, uh, the, uh, the uh, person who was at fault for this. And so we were able to look at a cost secure for this particular tree and um, assess the damages to that, that individual in order to make this tree healthy again. <clears throat> Uh, where that comes into play is, is and I, I'm not going to get into plant appraisal because that's a, a uh, six-day course in itself, but uh, um, it does change dramatically. So you can look at this particular red maple to the left, and you can look at the large elm tree at Sequoia Park on the right. Um, if, if those particular trees were damaged, the, the size of that tree, the location of the tree, the historical significance of that tree, um, all of those things come into play during a plant appraisal. And so if a car were to run into the tree on the right, uh, you, can, you can definitely uh, expect a lot larger uh, appraised value than the tree on the, on the left. <clears throat> And with that, I am going to say thank you. I am uh, five minutes past my due time, but I did do think the tree board was, uh, set up 30 minutes for questions or for Q and A. Um, so Tracy, uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna go ahead and let you read off any questions we may have. And if people may ask questions in the dialog box uh, as well. So, and for those of you who don't wanna stick around for Q and A, I, I appreciate you all attending tonight. So, Tracy. We don't have any questions in the chat box. If anyone is not familiar with Zoom, Ooh. if you hover your mouse down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see this little 
chat feature. If you click on that, it'll open your chat feature and you can type a message. Oh, wait, let's see. There's one thing that just popped up. I once asked who does the landscaping at the North Target shopping center that Elizabeth, the other Elizabeth is referring to and was told Bevco, which is mostly about parking lots, but their website says they also do some landscaping. She meant to contact them, but never did. And there's a website there. Will there be a tree mitigation bank for people who can't meet the requirements from Joyce? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, we are right now, again, we are looking at the uh, Article 3 of the tree, excuse me, Article 2 of the Tree Protection Ordinance. Um, if your head's spinning, my head's definitely spinning. Uh, but uh, we, we are looking at that right now. Uh, I have met with administration, and so an example of this would be, um, you know, a, a property where a building footprint makes up the entire parcel of land. So let's say they buy, apply for a building permit, they're gonna make improvements to that particular building. Um, we can't require them to plant six trees per acre because their building footprint makes up for the entire building footprint uh, or for the entire parcel. Um, and so what we could do is offer a tree mitigation bank where they can offset trees at a different location. And we are looking at that as of right now. Um, I think there's interest in the way it would work is whatever that requirement is, they can pay into the tree bank and then the city can plant trees on alternative locations as needed. So we still get the benefits of those particular trees. Good question. Um, Elizabeth Martinez asks, would you consider adding a heritage tree protection measure for mature large trees on private property? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, they're actually, uh, I, I did not mention it to tonight because um, just reading that makes my head spin uh, um, and it's really not set up for preserving trees more so than preserving trees on a historical property. Um, it's, it's, it's really, it's really bizarre. Uh, it's only come to play one time, but essentially what it is is any tree 20 inches in diameter of a, a, a parcel of land or excuse me, next to a building that was built before 1860, uh, that 20 inch diameter tree has to be within 100 feet, um, cannot be removed without the approval of this urban forester. Well, you could have a 20 inch diameter, let's say tree of heaven, which is an invasive tree, and you could have a 19 inch diameter uh, red oak, and they can cut down the red oak all day long, but that invasive tree it still has to be preserved so yes uh, we are considering it with the uh, the improvements um, but um, it, it also needs to be something that's going to work for our community uh, there's oftentimes anytime you start looking at trying to preserve trees on private property can be somewhat controversial um, especially uh, you know when you're in a property right state like we are in Tennessee so but we are looking at that. The way we're looking at it is possibly look exploring the historical overlay of a of an area and see about um, what you know maybe making a size requirement on in the historical overlay. So if you have a certain tree of a certain size, let's say 35 inches in diameter or so, um, and it's in a historical overlay, uh, that tree would need to be you know obviously we wouldn't prevent anybody if it was a hazardous situation maybe we would just ask that a certified arborist uh approve that the tree is a hazardous before or a hazard of some sort before the trees were removed so we are looking at those options but uh, we have to uh be careful um, and make sure it's something that the community wants so good question lee asks he, well, he says, great job, Casey. So I understand you said roughly 75% of the budget goes towards privately owned trees conflicting with public property and utilities. Is removal an option for these repeat offenders? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we, they are. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes, uh, uh, that is what we, we, we try and do is work with those property owners and, and give them an opportunity to fix the problem. Uh, we have just started using door hangers um, and they've been very successful in, in saying, hey, look, you either do this yourself or we're going to do it. And uh, oftentimes people do 
are active and take care of it. But yes, that's why we have our inventory. So we can go back and look at oftentimes, like if you have a site distance issue and let's say take a redbud tree that was planted in a horrible location. And, and we may give those individuals an opportunity the first time to go ahead and prune it. They prune it. If it comes back again, um, we may address it at that particular time and say, Hey, look, we have, here's our historical records. We've been out here three different times every year. We're out here at this point in time, we're, we're going to uh, ask that that tree be removed. And we do have it set aside that we do have the uh, ability to do removals in those particular options. Oftentimes it's not trees that you want to remove. You got to look at the benefits of the tree. So it may be, you know, limbs that are growing down. It may be just one and done trees where we're going in there pruning that one time and we're set for the next 25, 30 years. So um, oftentimes it's not repeat offenders, but yeah, that is, that is a good point. Graham asks, how is the root protection area impacted by the property, by property lines? Yeah, so it, it doesn't, so for public trees, it, it's, it involves, uh, there is no property line. So it, it goes all over into wherever those tree roots may be. So it's just 20%. Um, so for instance, if we plant a tree in the right of way and it goes over into private property and somebody wanted to build a new driveway, um, they would have to get a permit to impact the root system of that public tree prior to putting the sidewalk in, or excuse me, the driveway in. So good question. I have a question, Casey, about parks. Um, about what? Say, about parks, city parks. So what if oh, somebody, okay. what if somebody is getting ready to do a construction and there are trees on, that borders a city park and there's trees on the property line that might be affected by the construction? What would happen in that case? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, if, that, if those trees would be impacted, they would uh, have to be looked at as far as what the impact's going to be. And if, it, if it's going to impact the, the root zone of that particular tree, um, we would ask that a, a permit would be filed. Now, oftentimes, let's say, uh, we have a, a um, I'm, I'm just gonna use a, a, a fast food restaurant again. And we have a public tree next to their parking lot. And that fast food restaurant is turned over and they're gonna make a new uh, building there. Well, if that building is, or that tree is next to their parking lot, the expectation is that you're not gonna find a lot of roots down in that parking lot of that particular area. So we wouldn't consider that parking lot part of the critical root zone. So we would allow for um, uh, that project to proceed without having to get a permit, as long as they stay out of that area where the impervious or the pervious area was, or where the tree strip was, where the tree was growing. So it, it's it critical root zone. Um, I could probably sit up here and show you 45 to 50 different uh, diagrams and examples and where you would expect to see trees. It's really learned. Um, through, um, you know, an arborist, the experience of the arborist and knowing trees, because we can't see tree roots and we can't typically easily just know where they're going to be. And so it takes a lot of um, guessing, um, estimating where they're going to be, a lot of science and understanding the environment in which they grew to make those judgment calls. Um, oftentimes I'll, I'll tell the, uh, the folks to, you know, go get a, go get an arborist, a private arborist to sign off on this, to, to, to uh, show me that the, tree, the public tree is not going to be impacted. And um, it works pretty well because knowing that we have those set standards and we have the International Society of Arboriculture that administers, you know, the, the professionalism of arborists and making sure that they're certified, you know, as long as I'm requiring a certified arborist, I know what I'm getting as far as the, the, uh, the, uh, the input from them is going to be accurate and it's going to be in the public's interest. So how does someone, know, how does somebody know though? So, because I know that if someone's getting a building permit or they're, you know, they have to go through codes and things like that. Are they given this paperwork when they apply for a code? I mean, how would somebody know that, Oh, that's a public tree. Yeah, so, to get permission. Yeah. So that, that's typically done through that initial review process um is the uh, if you're if you're they're about applying for a building permit 
um, those those initial reviews are going to look one of the things that they're going to look for are the close proximity of public trees and typically as long as the and we've had issues with people not putting all the trees on their plans and trying to do a review and things have been been missed because of that but uh, typically you're going to know uh, close proximity uh, of that project's going to be in close proximity to public trees and we're going to be able to to make sure that they have the right permits in play at that point in time through the uh, through just the process that's in play for any other development that goes on and uh, it's a little bit harder when you start talking about, you know, the things that don't require a building permit, you know, you're talking, um, you know, anytime there's any type of work within the right of way, it does need to be permitted through the office of engineering. So that helps out a little bit. Um, but you know, people build sheds, people build pools, people dig holes for fences. Uh, so, you know, those are those are the harder ones. The little case by case scenarios like that, which make it a little bit more difficult to uh, to regulate when I'm one person. Still, good question. At this, at this point, we don't have any more questions. Does anyone else have any more questions? Well, it looks pretty quiet. Right. Hey, this I is Greg. I just I just want to thank everybody for. Uh, coming by tonight and sticking around. It looks like most everybody stuck around for the whole talk. And um, I know I learned a lot, uh, even though I've been on the tree board for a while now, um, there were some things uh, that I didn't know. So that was great. Casey, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for, you know, staying late and, uh, and giving us this talk. I would also like- I appreciate to everybody's time. I would also like to say this was recorded. So if anyone wants to review it or send it to a friend, uh, it will be at the Trees Knoxville YouTube site. So if you go to YouTube, just put in the search bar Trees Knoxville, our page will come up. And um, I don't know if the city will post it anywhere, but it'll definitely be there on the Trees Knoxville YouTube page. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks Thank you all. And good night. Good night.